Welcome to another episode of Real People, Real Stories, where we provide you with compelling tales from everyday people just like you. I'm your host, John Wendell Adams, author of the novels Betrayal and Payback, along with the soon-to-be-released novel, Ruthless. You can always find me by going to john at johnwendelladams.com. So for the next 23 minutes, let's get to today's guest. I get to know him not just theologically anymore, but in a tangible and real way. (laughs) Hey, Fernando. Hey, good, John. How's it going? It's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you, man. You know, I've been thinking about this for a while. You know, you and I just uh, hanging out here. So it's it's great to finally pull this off. So thank you for coming and joining us. I really appreciate that. Thanks for inviting me. This is such a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tell me your name. Tell me what part of the country you live in and tell me what you do. Cool. Do you want me to roll the R in how I pronounce my name? That's the big yes. question. Yes, okay. I do. Right. Yes, okay. I do. Here we yes, go. So my name is Fernando Mercado. And if I say it that way, people ask me how to spell that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want it more in the English version, my name is Fernando Mercado. And I live here in wonderful Chicago with my wife, Miriam, and three daughters. And um, I'm in advertising. I have been in the digital marketing world for over 20 years, I think. And I'm currently working for one of the largest nonprofits in the country in block banking. And um, I'm the national director of digital advertising. So it's a fun job and it's a fun place to be in. That's great. And boy, You know, Fernando, I've known you for quite a while, and you've been in advertising since I've known you. And that's a great spot for you because you exude the things that uh, I would imagine transpires in that uh, advertising world. And so uh, thank you again for coming and joining us. Sure. Yeah, my pleasure. Good to be here. Well, when, yeah. So when we hung out much earlier and we're thinking about doing this thing, you have a very compelling story. And I want to get right. I want to get right into that. And it starts with you growing up in uh, Bolivia, in South Af- in South America. And That's so, right. Yeah. And so, if you would please uh, tell me about. I know you're one of four, youngest of four uh, children, and tell me about your growing up years, uh, particularly uh, as you grew up, and the fact that your mom and dad had a uh, an influence on you. Not always uh, the best, but. Uh, just talk about that, if you would. Yeah, when, uh, man, where to start here? I mean, there's just so many things you can say right about your childhood and growing up. I try to focus on maybe the good and maybe where things could have been a little different. So I was the youngest of four, like you said. Um, my oldest brother was the oldest of all four of us. And then there's two sisters in between and then me. But there's about only four and a half years between my brother and I. So we were really close in age and it was really fun because we were friends. And even to this day, we are friends. That's um, great. I grew up in the, one of the third largest city in Bolivia, right downtown. But back then, where I lived, it wasn't too crazy in terms of traffic or people. So I could go skating. I could go on my bike with uh, neighbors and friends. So it was really fun because I had that sense of community quite a bit. And that was beautiful. Uh, I grew up not in, in a Christian home necessarily. My, my dad was an atheist. My mom maybe had a nominal faith um, coming from the Catholic background. Um, and with that, I think, came some of the family dynamics that you cannot always as a child. You know, there's never a perfect environment. Uh, you wish they were a little different. So one of them was we would cover up things that we would do wrong, right? So for instance, my dad in his job, when people call him from work after hours when he was home, he didn't want to answer the phone. And this is just a, a silly, simple example. So if the phone would ring, he would tell my mom or any of us, if it's for me, tell them I'm not home. I'm on a trip. He's like, what? (laughs) All right. So, okay. I guess you don't want to answer the phone, but that stuck in my head, in our heads, I think, 
um, as people that, hey, if you don't want to face reality, just make something up. You know, the interesting thing about that is there are good things that we hear growing up, and then there are things that are not so good. But right. both, of, both of those have a way of kind of sticking with us for, for a number of different reasons. And it sounds like that was one, the whole truth-telling mm-hmm. thing. Um, right. and, and so as you grew up, you continued to grow up, uh, you talked to me about some of the influences that affected your life. Uh, this whole notion of, well, as you articulated it, alcohol and things that uh, were along, along the lines and relationships with young ladies and such. Uh, talk mm-hmm. about that if you would. Part of, um, I think, what happened growing up is, yeah, my childhood was sometimes difficult in terms of my relationship with my father, especially. So I don't know if it was that necessarily or just my longing for good relationships. Um, there, we would see violence sometimes at home, sadly, okay, towards my mom, towards us kids. So as you grew older, and this is very common in, in America, at least in my home country, is that you know, as a teenager, you started drinking alcohol. So just you know, for the fun of it. So when I was 13, it was the first time that my buddies and I grabbed our first drinks and we got happy i would say not completely <laughs> overdosed in alcohol um but little by little i just started picking on that social drinking habit where almost every time i would hang out with my friends in high school and college we would just drink and yeah. drink too much to the point that you know your body loses control and everything and that wasn't wasn't good for myself, but also for my parents. It was hard for them to see me come back home drunk, sometimes getting lost and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so that wasn't easy. It, it affected my life, and I know it affected them too. Sure. And, and then on top of that, you know, seeking relationships with young, beautiful ladies. I was a ladies' man growing up. But I never I never thought I would ever fall in love with someone, although I had some relationships that were a little longer. Um, I never thought, oh, I'm going to find the perfect woman. I mean, I wanted that. The ladies that I would hang out with, they were nice and everything, good families. But I don't know. I didn't feel like maybe it was me, maybe it was them. My relationship would be promising for in the future. So yeah, very broken relationships and uh, a very broken life, I would say. And I appreciate your frankness and candor in that regard, uh, Fernando. I want to say to you that as we talked about this before, you indicated to me that there was a real life-changing event that that happened, uh, an accident, if you will. Uh, Describe that. Talk about how that impacted you. Yeah, so talk about relationships and alcohol mixed together. Sometimes that's not the best thing, okay? (laughs) So one night I go up with my friends and we go party and I have broken up with this girl. And then that one night um, after drinking too much, I ran into her and she was with another guy. And this was uh, kind of an acquaintance of mine. So I, I didn't think that they were together necessarily, but it upset me so much, right? Uh, and I think part of it was the alcohol in me that was just uh, clouding my thinking. So I say bye to my friends. I was driving my parents' car. I get into the car and I'm going back home. It was 3 a.m. So oh. I'm, I don't know how fast I was going, but I was getting into a roundabout, a pretty big roundabout. And I guess I didn't really think how much I needed to turn. <laughs> I ended up hitting a tree with the, right in front of the car. Oh. And it was pretty severe. I mean, it was a very bad hit to the point that if I had hit the tree with the car four inches to the left, I would have been killed at that moment. Oh, man. But all that happened... My friends somehow figured, well, let's just follow this guy because he's a little, a little too drunk. Um, my friends came along not too far behind from me, and they found me there. And I just got out of the car, walked, and I had a few scratches in my forehead. And that was it. Yeah. Wow. It was pretty uh, big. Yeah. Yeah. It was big enough, even though you were 
I'll just say saved from what could have transpired. Mm -hmm. It was big enough that it put you on a slightly different trajectory, right? right. Mm -hmm. And so talk to me about that, Fernando. What, what really came as a result of that, that accident? Well, I mean, I, it was my parents' car, and I had disappointed them, not just by damaging the car so badly, but just my attitude, right? So my relationship with my father got even worse at that point. And I felt terrible, depressed, that kind of thing. And I thought, well, I can't keep living on this lifestyle. So it's not that I stopped drinking completely, but my attitude towards it changed. And I realized, oh, maybe something happened here. Maybe something prevented me from being killed, really. Um, so about two years after, this accident, actually, in, in that period of time, I was, um, I used, I used to go to mass every once in a while. So one Sunday, I'm there with I think it was my mom. And, you know, I'm doing the reciting, get down on my knees up and stand up and down on my knees again. In the middle of that, I felt like something huge behind me was hugging me and embracing me from behind. And it was so powerful that I couldn't physically move. And it didn't feel scary. I mean, it felt really good. And I, I could picture almost uh, a, a giant dove hugging me from behind. And at that moment, I could almost hear a, the voice of God saying, when you were a kid and you were the youngest of four and you always felt like you were abandoned, you guess what? I never abandoned you. Wow. And on that car accident that you had, it was me that saved you. Wow. So I just started sobbing and, you know, realizing all of a sudden that it was really God that was speaking to me. And that, you know, that moment kind of faded away. I came back to my senses in a way. And I, all I knew at that time was Catholics, what do you do when you want to serve God? You become a priest. <laughs> so I thought I want to become a priest. I ended up talking to a few priests that I had uh, become a, uh, friends with. And one of them once said, well, Fernando, you could do, you could be a good priest, but you know what? We need more holy families. And I thought, mm -hmm. yes, that's a good war, brother. I want to <laughs> marry one day. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so, yeah yeah well pretty radical so, yeah you did not as a result of that uh, become a priest but uh, mm -hmm. you you listened to the words that you that you heard and then sometime later uh, a significant person came into your life and so tell me about her i've been going to these catholic workshops uh, all that time now after that event and I didn't feel like, you know, my faith was really there. I was even, I think, ashamed of, you know, well, you know, this man all of a sudden being a spiritual. I didn't want to admit that. Okay. But like you were saying, two years after the accident, um, one of my friends from college called me and said, hey, there's this girl visiting from the U.S. She's beautiful. She's your style. She's a pastor's daughter. And Aaron, rewind. What? What did she say she is? A pastor's daughter? <laughs> She's going to have a Bible in her arm, long skirts. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> anyway, long story short, I said, okay, let's meet your friend. I met her and right away. I mean, she was, she's beautiful. Uh, she became my wife later on, but she's beautiful, caring, smart. And, and more than that, I finally saw that her she had the kind of faith that wasn't just mental. It was real for her. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I, that's what I want for my life. And I, I want to get that. It wasn't just that I liked her so much. I liked what her faith looked like. And that mm -hmm. was important to me at that time. You meet her. And for the sake of this conversation, let's give her a name. This is Miriam. That's right. Yeah, my wife. Yeah. A couple things transpire. You go off to this retreat mm -hmm. and at that retreat there's some significant things that happened for you Fernando so 
Talk to me about that and the impact that it had on you. She was there just for another few weeks. So she came back to the U.S. And I was now attending this Baptist church that she was part of in Bolivia. And at one of these days, I asked God, okay, Lord, if you are real, I don't want to come here just because of her. I want this to be real. So I went to this retreat. And I was invited to with some young adults. And well, we were there for a two or three day session. I don't remember exactly. Um, this pastor started talking about the gospel, how Jesus died for us. And, you know, he is your God. And if you give your life to him, your life will change. So I'm looking around and I'm thinking, this is me. He's calling me. And I just couldn't do anything else but say yes. I want you, you are my God, and I want my life to change. You know, all this baggage that I was carrying, please take all that, take all my sins away. And it's a beautiful moment because for the first time, it wasn't just religion. For the first time in my life, I thought, wait a minute, this is the real deal. It is real. And I, all I wanted to do, I mean, man, I would listen to uh, worship songs. I would just devour scripture. I wanted to tell everyone about my faith. I got baptized. It was just a life, life changing experience for sure. And, and that's when I realized this is not religion. This is the relationship that God wants with me. That sounds exciting. It does. <laughs> right, right. It was. Yep. Yep. And I'd be interested in knowing uh, what really transpired then with uh, your relationship with Miriam? Thinking about not finding the right person before my life was changed. Uh, when I met her, I thought, well, again, she, she is really nice. And we started dating online. So she came back to the U.S., right? So we started talking online after some months, um, after I had become a, a Christian, I guess. We started dating and everything. And then we were at the point that, okay, it's been six, eight months since we know each other. And she was in Chicago, I was in Bolivia. One of us has to make the move here. And in, in, in the sense of at least spending more time together, because everything we knew about each other was just those two first weeks in Bolivia. And then online, like, you know, what we're doing right now, it was Skype back then. Right. Um, so I couldn't come here because of my visa. And what ended up happening was that she went back to Bolivia for the third time. And we were trying to figure out what's going to happen with our relationship here. Okay, so she comes back third time. Uh, you know, you're really feeling in your head and your heart that Miriam is the one. Um, she's not on the call today, so I can't ask her. But at that point, you were feeling, you know, really that this relationship is special. Your life has changed. And so she comes back a third time. Talk to me about the sequence of events that transpired after that, because from based on what you shared with me, it was pretty radical. So there was a mixture of different events that happened, right? So when she first came back on the third trip now, she and I went on a short missionary trip in Bolivia um, to help in an area that was extremely, extremely poor in the country. So while we were there, we just saw how caring, I guess, in a way, at least I could see how caring she was with other people, serving, loving them. And that was really special because I guess she saw some of that in me as well. So it was a really bonding moment for us. And then we came back to my home city and then spent more time together. We went to see one of my sisters in another city in Bolivia because, you know, I wanted the family to, to meet her. So they would give me their feedback. Hey, you know, do, do you like this person or not? <laughs> right. So we went and visited one of my sisters in Bolivia. We flew there. Wonderful time. Before I came back, before we flew back, my sister goes, hey, you're not, you, this is the one, right? You're going to ask her to, to get in here. <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay. No pressure, huh? We fly back home to Cochabamba. And as we land at the airport, we grab a cab. And, you know, we were in La La Land. We didn't really pay attention too much. But I guess it wasn't an official, because in, in Bolivia, you, there's official taxi cabs at the airport. So there was this, you know, it was the first taxi cab that we, that we saw. We came, took our bags, 
after no more than two miles, the guy would say, hey, I'm new to this. Can you tell me where to turn and everything? So he comes to a, a stoplight and he asked me, is this where we turn right? And I said, yeah. But he stopped for a little longer than the usual. Um, and all of a sudden, two men jumping in the back seat of the car. Well, we didn't know them, right? We were being attacked and robbed. We were kidnapped for about three to four hours going around the city, going to different ATMs, getting our money and our belongings stolen, um, violent, aggressive. It was really traumatic, man. It was really hard. It was hard for both of us, but it was especially hard in a different way for Miriam. And that, that broke her heart. Right. That, broke, that broke my heart because I couldn't save her. Right. That's how I felt. Right. And, you know, in the movies, you think, oh, you know, big guys are going to go punch this thieves, whatever, and, you know, Hollywood, like, everyone gets safe. That was not the case. Sure. It was about three months. We saw how in the midst of this darkness and, and really suffering, right, and trauma, we could care for each other. Uh, we saw that uh, she saw, I guess, that I could care for her, and I saw the same thing back. So everything before this was beautiful, la la land, happy, we love each other. She's amazing. I guess I was okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but at this point, we saw, well, we can really be together for the long run. If we can endure this with God's help, right. our marriage will be solid. So right. we said, okay, let's, let's do this. And I proposed. And thankfully, she said yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that must have been really really hard man i yeah. mean you talk you articulate it and you say well you know unlike the movies where you know you put some uh, karate moves on the mm -hmm. aggressors and lay them out on the ground and then you know you uh, are able to rescue the damsel in distress right. and life goes mm -hmm. on didn't happen that way and right. I can just, I can only imagine listening to you tell that story again. It's, uh, that must have been really impactful. And so to come out of that and then decide that, hey, this guy is all that and this woman is all that and make a decision to begin to consider a life together, mm -hmm. that must have been transformational. Yeah, it wasn't easy, right? Family members, especially there that had never met me. They were thinking, well, is this a decision you're making out of just a trauma? Is this a really good guy? So my in-laws came to meet me, meet my family and everything. And of course they saw that, you know, our love was real and everything. Um, and it was really a bonding moment. So, uh, you know, these events impacted our lives in, in a very dark way, but somehow, God made good out of it. And, and that's what we were thankful for. It wasn't easy. It was right, not easy right, at all. Right. Well, I can wow. imagine. Yeah. We've yeah. been married for 15 years now and, and, and happily married. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, advance the screen now. Fast forward. And so you and Miriam are in the U.S. You're married. Kids start happening. And you start having a significant series of dreams. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? I mean, what was going on for you? Back until that point, all I knew about God was that he was my savior and comforter, right? He was first in that retreat safe, called to his kingdom. And then when the, this dark event happened, we were comforted by him. Um, it wasn't just theology anymore. He was real in this sense. But one thing that happened, and this is five, six years after we got married, I started having these dreams. And I remember one of them in particular, um, Jesus came down from heaven, second coming, and he landed about 50 feet away from me. And he came and he embraced me and he said, I love you and I will show you the things that I did here on earth. So he was, so all of a sudden, this savior and comforter God that I knew became this powerful and generous God figure. Because what happened from there, it was just revealing through dreams and prophetic words and words of encouragement from people. My identity and my calling, I don't have the title of a pastor necessarily, but I have the heart of a pastor. 
mm-hmm. those dreams were just so powerful again that he was saying now here's my spirit do the things that i did now i've been trying to do that trying to be to be faithful serving in the church serving people and and i have seen miracles happening in front of me healing and prophetic words and interpreting dreams and stuff like that and it's just been such a beautiful picture of a fuller picture i would say of god who god is well you know what and thank you for that because uh not everyone experiences that, Fernando, as you probably mm-hmm. are aware, mm-hmm. but that's really a special gift that you were granted. And yet, as you continued on, you started having real difficulty sleeping. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you go from having dreams, real phenomenal, significant dreams, to not to having difficulty sleeping. So um, talk to me about that as well. Yeah, well, that's another interesting story because, you know, I I love to sleep. I used to be a good sleeper, but then kids came along and I couldn't. (laughs) But that wasn't the reason why I couldn't sleep anymore. So about, I don't know, some months ago, I guess, six months ago or so. Um, So now we are about almost 15 years of being married with Miriam. One night in particular, um, I fall asleep. I go to bed early, around 10, 10, 30. I fall asleep and then for maybe about 15 minutes or 20 minutes and then I wake up and I couldn't go back to sleep. So yeah. to, to get myself tired, I just started reading the Bible or a book. I started praying. Um, I didn't get tired enough. And it's like, okay, let's watch something on Netflix. And that did not help one bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, well, what else could this be? It's, it's 3 a.m., 4 a.m. And I was fully awake. And all of a sudden I think, God, are you trying to tell me something? And that's why you're waking me up. So I just started <laughs> intently praying more, more focus. And all of a sudden, I could almost feel like the whole Trinity was there with me. Mm. It was amazing. John, it was so powerful. I couldn't, can't even describe it, I don't think. But I could feel it was a mixture of knowing, yes, that's the truth. That's what we know about God. Right. But it, be, it wasn't a visual thing, but I could almost feel the presence in a minimal, I guess, scale. Because if you always, in the Bible says, if we see God, we die. But to a, a form of an encounter with God, mm. the Trinity, it wasn't just a theological understanding. It was a real thing. Right. And, and that was just, I think that has been one of the best things that I've ever had it in my whole life and wow it was was really beautiful yeah as part of that um encounter i would say uh one of the things that came out clearly was that my family history carries so much baggage in in the sense of sin and lies and adultery that there was something that it wasn't just my own sin anymore but it was a demonic oppression against my life Right. Um, and the accident that happened actually was something that Emmy was doing against my life to, to, to really yes. kill me, right? Sure. Um, so I, I realized that I needed to do something about all of this. So I called some friends to, to ask them to pray for me because they were doing some deliverance prayer. And that has to do with releasing people from the oppression of the enemy. Okay, so you get on a Zoom call like this. And for about two and a half hours, they were praying for me. And it was in this context of, I mean, I only knew one of the three, but in the context of just deep love, brotherly love for each other, where the spirit of God was invited. And I could say for the first time in my life, I was by my confession and by the releasing of the sin from past generations, even I was finally set free. Well, wow. wow. before I was saved, before I was comforted, I met the Holy Trinity. But I could say that now at this point, I was set free. And it's just, you know, the verse, I, mean, I think is why Luke 4, something like that. Jesus says, the spirit of God is in me and I have come to set the captives free, to reset the sight for the blind and to let prisoners be free out of captive. Right. Um, so that verse just came to life in, in, in my life as a real way. 
And I had to confess to Miriam some of my past and sins and, and lies and the secrecy that right. I had learned from my right. parents, right? Remember my dad yep. hiding himself from these calls? Yep. I learned all of that. I'm not saying that I was innocent of my own life, sure. but it was a habitual sin in my family that God wanted to break through. And uh, man, it's been just so powerful to be in that freedom. Well, Fernando, I just... First of all, I appreciate your frankness, your candor, my friend. I really do. Mm. And as we come to uh, the end of our time together, there are a couple things I want you mm -hmm. to, uh, yeah. if you can, respond to. One of those is, um, what have you learned as a result of this journey? And the fact is that there's more life to live. Mm -hmm. But what, what have you learned uh, as a result of this journey that you've described to me? And then the second question is, if you had the opportunity to talk with an individual or a group of folks, you know, that are mm -hmm. maybe have gone through some similar things, what do you think you'd say to them? So, yeah, mm -hmm. what, you, what you've learned and, and what, what you might communicate. You know, we tend to think that God comes to the rescue and he comes once and that's your saving experience. And therefore, right. that's all we know about him. Sure. Um, but not just in my experience, but when I read the Bible, when I hear God's heart, he doesn't seem to be the God that acts in just one act. Sure. So I think my life with him and even before him has been a journey where mm. he has revealed himself through these different, not just titles, but his character. Sure. So I have learned that throughout my life, it has been a path where he's showing me new things about who he is. And that has just been so powerful and beautiful yeah. because I get to know him, not just theologically anymore, but in a tangible and real way. How can I ever doubt him? How can I, anyone ever doubt his goodness? And that has been really dear to my heart. Mm. because he is real right so if i could share that with someone else right if anyone that has maybe similar questions or background i would have to say two different things one is that maybe what god wants us to do is to really come empty-handed and and maybe ask him to really reveal what is holding us back in having a deeper or truer relationship with him where he wants to set us free, deep into the heart, right? whatever background, whatever experience, whatever sins we may have, he wants to give us life and set us free. So that was my experience. And I know that could be your, I mean, yours, right? Whoever is listening to this. Sure. And, sure. And, and second, I think I would encourage anyone that maybe has made that step of faith and is thinking, okay, I'm good. I'm saving him. I'm his family now to think about with this life, we got, it's a journey. And you know, no matter what sins have been in your life, or maybe even now, right? We, John, you look very perfect to me, but I'm sure you have some some little sin in there. In you, much like I do, right? Yep. But yep. there's, I don't know, what was it? Romans eight talks about there's nothing. If I can read this one verse, you know, it says, "I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate separate us from God's love, right. neither death nor life." neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from the God, from God's love. Right. And, and that's really my encouragement to, to, to people today that cling to God in that journey, no matter what is happening in your life, sure. uh, nothing will separate us from him. So that's what I live in the, the world that I live in. And that's what I think God wants for everyone too. There's some richness, Fernando, in the things that you just shared. And boy, I'm just uh, taking that in as you talk about it. And mm. uh, I, I just love what you had to say. You know, there's um, even as you were talking, there's something that comes to mind. It's really from uh, John, I think it's 836. that it says, know the truth and the truth will set you free. Mm. Mm -hmm. And for he who is free is free indeed. And I think about that, even as you told that story about, you know, the things that were generational, that needed to be broken, the things that required confession on your part, that in doing those things and really 
knowing and embracing the truth that it puts you in that freedom condition. And that's mm-hmm. a, that's a truly is a beautiful thing. And I have to tell you, Fernando, I mean, I just, I was looking so forward, as I said earlier, uh, to getting together with you. And it seems like you are on this trajectory that is just leading your life in a beautiful, beautiful way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I would just ask you that as things continue to transpire and there are new revelations that you come into that you would agree to come back and, and share those things as well. Sure, that'd be my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, John. This was, this is wonderful, this was fun. Thanks for, you know, the interest of talking with me and yeah. I hope we do this again sometime soon. Well, you know, and the reality is, as I told you <laughs> before, it's just like two guys hanging out. So I can't look, I'm uh, looking forward to the, I can't wait till the next time that we do this. That's right, yeah, let's do it. So <laughs> thank you again for coming on. Uh, have a, a great rest of the day and shoot, we'll talk soon. All right. Sounds good. You too, John. You can always find me by going to john at johnwindeladams.com. 